Hello and welcome back to the NNP Symposium. Uh, we are in our last day and getting close to the end of our presentations, but we still have quite a few exciting ones left. Um, so a couple housekeeping things before we get into this presentation. A uh, reminder, we will be doing a Q&A at the end. Like I'm sure you're tired of hearing about by this point in the weekend, there's a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A to send in questions. You can send them in at any time, but we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, that's it, we're good. Uh, so for this presentation, we'll be hearing from Christopher McDowell on a new taxonomy for Franco-American jet jetons, the originals from Restrix. And Christopher McDowell is someone that I've had the pleasure of working with for quite a few years now. Uh, he is the president of C4, the Colonial Coin Collectors Club, the editor for Gene, the Journal of Early American Numismatics, and has done quite a bit of research into metals of different series. Um, so Chris, I will let you take it away and I'll be back at the end for the Q&A. Thank you, Leanna. I hope everybody can hear me. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. This, uh, this topic is an enormous topic. Uh, it, it covers many years and lots of, lots of metals. I got into this uh, because I'm working on a series of books on Betts metals, and this is a Betts metal. Uh, these are Betts metals 385 to 395. And so when I first got you know, to Betts 385, I began to look at, uh, you know, what are these things and quickly realized that there are a lot of problems with them. Uh, this is what Michael Hodder said uh, when he prepared the uh, Ford catalog for Ford uh, 13. He additionally wrote this. There needs to be a more modern and technically sophisticated study of these jetons before their importance can really be appreciated. Well, I'm sure everyone will be happy to know that I've prepared uh, that at this time. I have about 70 pages on these Franco-American jetons prepared for the second volume of my book on Betts Metals. The first volume is going to be uh, out in December of this year, just in time for Christmas. And it's going to cover uh, bets number one through bets 170. Uh, these Franco-American jetons are going to be in the second volume, uh, which I am almost finished writing. So what are they? You know, what are Franco-American jetons? This is a, these are a series of jetons uh, that were first made in 1751, and they were made until 1758. Uh, they came out every January from the Paris Mint, and they portrayed scenes, and really they were advertisements uh, for French colonialism, for to try to encourage French citizens to go to the New World uh, and explore. And so they presented the wonders uh, of the new of the New World to the French people. One of the things that they were not, and it's important to understand that they were not, these were not coins to be used in the new world. They were not tokens to be used in the new world in Canada or, or elsewhere. They were jetons. Uh, and so we have to, you have to appreciate that. Most of it, in my opinion, it's very doubtful uh, that many of them even reached the new world. So they were trying to encourage people to go to the new world, not to be used in the new world. One of the issues we'll find out with these Franco-American jetons is that almost immediately after they came out in 1751, the Paris Mint began to do restrikes. Uh, the French just fell in love with these Franco-American jetons. And so there are hundreds of restrikes that were made, not just immediately, but also for the probably the next 180 years. The Paris Mint made restrikes uh, of these jetons. And so when you start to collect them, you begin to realize that what is real and what is a restrike? There can only be one original Franco American jeton that was issued in each year. And many people have tried to decide well, which one is it? Uh, which one's real and which one's a restrike? Uh, and uh, I've read all the literature in them. And uh, for the most part, everyone's gotten it wrong. Today, for the first time, we're going to learn which, in many of these years, was the original 
jeton that was issued in Paris in the given year. This is part of my taxonomy. You, you wouldn't understand it at this point, but it can give you some idea of the number of varieties that were issued in each of these years. So, you know, when you look at, well, which one is the original and which one is a restrike? Sometimes the originals uh, or the restrikes are easy to tell because the edge will have a cornucopia or something else indicating that it was a later restrike struck in the, uh, in the 19th century. But for the most part, what, what we're talking about here are these jetons that do not have any markings uh, on the edge. And so it's impossible for you really to know whether it's a restrike or it's an original. That is what I'm talking about here. Not the ones that are obviously uh, restrikes, but the ones uh, that we don't know. All right, let's get into this. This is the 1751 Franco-American jeton. It is, a, it is a beautiful design. All of these jetons have beautiful and meaningful designs. And that's one of the reasons why they're so popular and why they were restruck for almost 200 years. So let's look at the meaning of, of the, the wording on the legend on this reverse. Basically, you have a, a Native American uh, who's looking back on a, on a field of lilies. And it says in Latin, they grow under every star. This is referring to the lilies or the people in the colonies of France, that they grow and they spread throughout the world. So it's a very positive message. And we'll see as time goes on how this message begins to morph a little bit uh, into something maybe not necessarily darker, but something uh, a little different. But at first, in 1751, we have a very positive message, a very lovely message with a wonderful image uh, about how the French people, you know, spread and are, are, are colonizing the world. And so this is, a, this, is a, this is the first jeton. So what are some of the problems with it? Well, I mentioned one, which is all the, the different varieties. And that's the main one we're going to talk about. So here, here we have a typical 1751 uh, Franco-American jeton. This is Betts number 385. And so here's another one. So this, most people would also list as a Betts 385. But you can tell the obverse is very different from the previous obverse. And here's another one. Also Betts 385. This one, you'll see the reverse is different. There's a, uh, an alligator or a crocodile uh, on the reverse. Sometimes the obverses of, this is Louis the 15th on the obverse. Most of what we're going to talk about is going to be the reverses, but all of them have Louis the 15th in one form or another on the obverse. Some of the differences, as I said, are subtle. The differences between these two obverse, if you can look at the ribbon across his chest, there is a, a sprig in that bottom corner, a triangular corner at about 12 o'clock. And on the one on the left, there's one sprig. And on the one on the right, there are uh, more than one, two. And so these are two different varieties. So again, here's the re here's a reverse of the 1751. One with, with alligator and one without alligator. So it's a very obvious uh, difference in the reverse here. So the first question that we have to ask is, are these Canadian tokens? Uh, many of the older books list these as Canadian tokens and specifically categorize them as Canadian numismatic items. Well, they're not. They are representative of the entire French colonies uh, throughout the New World, most of which were, you know, you're talking about the Caribbean islands, Louisiana, the Mississippi area, uh, and very obvious one thing here that it has an alligator on the reverse, and there are no alligators uh, in Canada. Uh, alligators are cold-blooded animals, and they don't live in Canada, so it would be uh, a bit odd to have a Canadian numismatic piece that had an alligator on it, considering that alligators 
don't live in Canada, never have. So that's a brief overview of 1751 Franco-American Jeton. And now I'm gonna look at the 1752 and we'll get more and more in depth on in these as we go along. So here's the image on the 1752 Franco-American Jeton. Again, I'm gonna focus on the reverse. You just assume uh, because that the obverse is going to have Louis the 15th on it. There are some different obverses, but we're going to focus uh, on the reverses here because that's really how you differentiate between the years. So again, here we have a, another a very positive sort of message, a propaganda piece distributed in January to the people of, uh, of Paris and to France uh, to encourage them to colonize the world. And here the, the language on the reverse indicates, you know, he creates commerce for both worlds, French colonies in America. And so it is, you know, the image of Mercury uh, and he is spreading not just the French people as we saw in the first one, but now it's French commerce. And it talks about how important the colonies are uh, to the commerce of France. So here is a, another of the 1752 uh, jetons. This is a better image of one. Again, in 1752, we have the same problem that we had in 1751, which is there that there are many of these jetons. And telling the original from the restrike is, is pretty much impossible. People have said different things about how to do it, uh, looking at the edge, is the edge beveled? Uh, is it you know certain weight? And, and I'm here to tell you that all of that is bunk. Uh, you cannot use that as a way to tell the original uh, from the restrike. So how do you tell the originals from the restrike? Well, I decided to look and see if there was any contemporary documentation uh, regarding what were the original ones. So at first I came across this piece from 1752 uh, in London, uh, from London. It describes the uh, 1752 Franco-American Jeton that we were just talking about. Uh, but this, this description could fit any uh, of the varieties. And so while it's nice to know uh, that there was some English uh, magazine that discussed the topic, it doesn't really help us narrow them down. But knowing what I know about newspapers and magazines at the time, I know that they all plagiarized one another. And so when this one talks about how they learned from basically from France about these jetons being issued, then I began to look at French magazines and French newspapers to see what could be found. And fortunately, I came across this. Uh, this is a, a magazine that uh, was printed uh, in France for many years. It's basically their equivalent of the gentleman's um, magazine. And not only does it have a description of the Franco-American jetons, but it has an illustration. And so uh, here's my a book that I purchased, and it has... The one you're looking at now is the 1752, but my book has the, you, know, you can see, it has an insert in it that has the 1751. And so through these, with an image of it, so the, on what you're looking at now on the screen, in the center at the top is the obverse. So we know that the original obverse that came out in January 1752 uh, has the image of Louis the 15th with this lion mantle uh, uh, around his neck. And on the bottom left, you can see that reverse that we were looking at with mercury and commerce between the two. So what we need to do is look at all of the varieties for 1752 and see which one matches with this obverse image. And there it is. One of the things that's interesting about this and the 1751 original Franco-American Jeton, 
And that's the original 1751 Franco-American Jeton, is that they are both copper, not silver. Uh, but you can you can again compare what was in that French magazine with all of the obverses and uh, reverses. The reverses, for the most part, are the same, uh, but come up with and determine what is the one and true and only original Franco-American Chaton, which really makes this series much more collectible. Because one of the problems is when you go to buy these is you don't know, well, am I buying an original, the original one that was issued in 1752, or am I buying one that was issued in 1759 or 1820? Uh, and there was really no good way to tell the difference. But now you people are the first to know uh, this is the original 1752 Franco-American Jeton. So if you're going to collect them, collect this one as the original. You can collect all the varieties, uh, but you want to start with this one for 1752 and this one for 1751. And fortunately, and this does not always hold true for all the years, but this is one of the least expensive as well. It's because mo mostly because it's copper and also because it's very prevalent. There, there's lots of these uh, out on the market. So it's, it's not difficult. In fact, I think if you go to eBay right now, uh, probably for the next hour until other people go and buy it, you can find this um, original 1751 Franco-American Jeton on eBay. I think there's actually maybe two or three of them, or at least there were uh, last week. So now let's let's move on to 1753. So here's a 1753 uh, Franco-American Jeton. And this has uh, another uh, wonderful message uh, that it is being that's being conveyed, another propaganda piece uh, for the, the French people. So again, sort of ignore the the obverse. You can see this is a uh, 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 a different obverse than what we've looked at so far. Focus on the on the reverse. And of these, there are nine known varieties. So the reverse states, one enough for both French colonies in America. And then you know, it's got all this uh, wording on it that's in the map. But what does that, what's that trying to convey? Well, what it's trying to convey is that there's one sun and there's one sun is good enough for both hemispheres. Similarly, one king, Louis XV, is also good enough for both hemispheres. That's the image. This is sort of bolstering Louis XV uh, as a sort of the, the leader and the ruler of the world. And just as there's one son, there's one leader uh, who's good enough for the whole world. And that leader happens to be uh, Louis XV. The 1753 uh, Jeton with that image of the two hemispheres is a little harder to find uh, than some of the other uh, Franco-American Jetons. It's a little, little more rare uh, than the other ones. Unfortunately, uh, un, unlike 1751 and 1752, uh, I was unable to find at this time that um, French magazine that had the illustration of the 1753 Franco-American Jeton. So it's a little unclear at this time as to which is the original 1753 Franco-American Jeton. But quite frankly, you're uh, lucky to find any 1753 Franco-American Jetons because they're all uh, quite rare. Let's look at the 1754 Franco-American Jeton. Uh, again, here we have another uh, wonderful image. And this one is one of the things I think that probably initially led people to believe that these were Canadian. Uh, and that's because you've got three beavers uh, on the back. I think I call it the, uh, the busy beavers um, Jeton. Uh, you can see the obverse here is quite different than some of the other obverses that we've been looking at. There is there's no one engraver who created all the odd verses. There, there are multiple engravers who were involved uh, with the odd verses uh, 
all, the, all different obverse varieties. Um, this the reverse here is made by um, Charles Norbert um, Rotier, and he created several of the reverses, which leads me to believe that you can. He probably also created some of the original obverses that uh, I, I'm not able to determine which are the when I'm not able to determine which is the original. This is the you know, the listing of the 1753s and the 1754s that we were just talking about. So what's this? Uh, the 1754 states, the products of the colonies are not inferior to metals. And so what this is in reference to, in my opinion, is that what you, what you have going on here is sort of a battle between the Spanish colonies and the French colonies. In the, in the Spanish colonies, they found, you know, all this wonderful silver uh, and other natural resources uh, in the New World, which you know, was causing the Spanish Empire to become very wealthy. And here the French are, are trying to say through their propaganda piece uh, that the products of the colonies of France, mostly beaver pelts, beaver skins, uh, in this case, are not inferior to metals, I meaning they're not inferior to the silver and gold that you might have found, that the Spanish might have, might have found. And so, again, they're trying to bolster their, their colonies in the New World through this propaganda piece. This is an official uh, government-issued uh, jeton from the Paris Mint, uh, you know, again, designed to encourage people to go to the New World. So they're telling them, you know, while you might not find silver, you're going to find something just as valuable as silver in the French colonies, and this is going to be, you know, beaver pelts and other things like that, other natural things like that. This same sort of uh, image, in a way, or this message carries over into 1755, the 1755 uh, Franco-American jeton has a sort of a similar message. Here, here you have in 1755, uh, again, sort of obverse of Louis the 15th, and you can see it, this is very similar to the obverse that we saw before with the lion mantle, but here we have initial of a, of a different engraver on it. But on the reverse of the 1755, it, it says not less valuable than the golden, i.e. the pelt, uh, the peltry of the beaver is no less desirable than the golden fleece. So you have the uh, the ancient galley representing Jason's Argo sailing to the right, and from the mast, instead of the golden fleece, hangs a beaver pelt. Uh, again, uh, symbolizing that the products and the things to be found in the French colonies of the New World, these beavers, uh, are just as valuable as gold. Again, sort of competition with the Spanish message uh, in the Spanish colonies and letting people know there's plenty of good things to be found in the French colonies too. The 1755 Franco-American Jetons, I have uh, eight known varieties. And when I talk about known varieties here, these are known varieties that are either or quasi original that uh, that have this image uh, on it that is it's not on the there's no edge markings or nothing like that there's no way to really tell uh, which would be the real uh, from the uh, restrike and so there are eight of those types of of these here's just a here's a couple uh, of them. So again, we're faced with this question of which is the original. In 1755, again, we have our French magazine comes to the rescue with another illustration. Uh, and here we have on the left, number one is the uh, reverse that we've been talking about of the 1755 Franco-American jeton. And on the right 
are three different obverses that were used that year for various jetons that were issued, official jetons that were issued that year. We're only concerned with the top one, the, the image of Louis the 15th. The, the two with the women were not, were not matched with the Franco-American jetons, just the top one. So what we have to do is find which uh, of, the, of the varieties has that obverse uh, co uh, compared to that reverse, that is the obverse on the right, and then we will know which is the original because this magazine came out, I think, in uh, May or April of 1755 and is an illustration of the official ones that were issued uh, this year. And so here is the original 1755 Franco-American jeton, unlike the 1751 and 1752 jeton, this one is in silver. This is a little bit of a shift away uh, from the copper, probably because of the popularity of these designs. They were, they felt they could make them in silver and still make a profit. So you, this is you all are the first ones to learn for for sure uh, what is the original 1755 Franco-American jeton. So if you're going to collect, now you know. 1755 is a little different from the other years in that there was a uh, jeton that was matched with a different obverse. Uh, than one that contained Louis the Fifteenth on it, uh, and this one it's it's a uh, it's a wonderful um, jeton. This is a uh, a muling between the 1741 marine jeton and the reverse of the 1755 Franco-American jeton uh, to form this uh, this one this this wonderful message here. Uh, very similar because on the obverse. You have, you know, this image that also conveys commerce and power uh, in the sea, and then matched with this reverse. This is the uh, rarest of the Franco-American jetons. It's the key to the series, uh, and the, one of the reasons why it's the rarest is because with all the others, you have many, many varieties, but with this one, there's only one, which is this this variety, it's it. There's no varieties of this variety. It's the only one, this muling, um, with this wonderful image uh, between the two. Here's 1756 Franco-American Chaton, and it has this image on the reverse. Uh, these are two beehives separated by a string, uh, one on the left and one on the right. And what it's signifying is it's the new world and the old world and the bees represent the French people moving from one uh, to the next. So within the 1756 varieties, there are six known varieties that year. Uh, this is a, a little, little more rare than some of the other Varieties. It's a little more difficult to find. One of the reasons is there's less, uh, less, less out there. What does it mean? So the legend here says they changed their home, but not their heart. So it's speaking of the French colonists. The French colonists, uh, you know, they they move from France to the New World, uh, but their heart is still with France. One of the differences between the French colonists and the English colonists is that pretty much wherever the French colonists went, they took their their religion, their love of France uh, with them. They always maintained uh, a loyalty to the king uh, and and the king uh, maintained sort of a greater love for his people than perhaps one would say that the English, between the English and the, the English colonists were much more independent than were the French colonists. And so this, this medal here speaks of sort of a mutual love affair between the French people and the, and the French government 
and its French colonies. Again, these are propaganda medals. You shouldn't be confused. Uh, certainly there are problems between the French colonists and their government. But when you look at these, these jetons, they're trying to convey sort of a very positive message uh, and give people reason to go and colonize the new world. With this 1756 uh, Franco-American Jeton, uh, there is a, a magazine, a rich contemporary source from which we can make a determination as to which is the original Franco-American Jeton. Uh, but there's a bit of a problem here uh, because as you'll see, it could be when you match up the images, uh, it could be one of two. So let's look. So similar to the 1755 that I showed you, we have uh, on the right, upper right, is Louis the 15th, which is the one that is ma matched uh, with the reverse for 1756. We see there with the Roman numeral nine is the French colonies, the uh, Franco-American jeton. So what we would be looking for in order to find the original 1756 Franco-American jeton would be one that has that obverse, that upper right obverse image of Louis the 15th. The problem is when I looked at all the different varieties, there are two uh, that, it, that it could be. Uh, there are two that, that matched it. Obviously, the magazine had a, an artist rendition uh, of, the, of the jeton, not intended for the purpose that I'm putting it, um, but nonetheless, it can be used for the purpose that I'm putting it. But unfortunately, in this year, that artist drawing is not you know, exact. And when we look at the different uh, uh, jetons, it could be two of them. Uh, I narrowed it down. It's my opinion that uh, if you, you look at, the, at it, the ribbon at the end of the hair, uh, I believe it matches more closely to the one on the left. Perhaps reasonable people can disagree. But at least here now, instead of looking at all the different varieties and, and weighing them and uh, coming up with speculation and supposition as to which one it is, we've narrowed it down uh, to just two. Uh, and so the, you know, the margin of error is much less than it was when you're just looking at all of those Franco-American jetons for that year and trying to determine which one it is. So I concluded that it was that it was this one, uh, that this is the original uh, 1756 Franco-American jeton for the reasons that I just explained. So now we'll move to 1757. We have one more year after this, and then we'll talk about the, uh, the taxonomy. So here's 1757. It has a, a really great design on the reverse, but now the imagery on the reverse of the jeton is starting to switch from that positive message, which we saw in 1751, 1752, about how great the colonies are, and uh, 1753 and 55 and so forth, about how these colonies are as good as the Spanish colonies, that, that, that the beavers are as good as, as gold or silver. Now it's a little more militaristic. Uh, this one uh, shows you know, Mars and um, Neptune with weapons in their hands. Uh, and it says, the remotest land prepares triumph. So what's going on? What caused sort of this positive image to change to more militaristic uh, image? And, and of course, it's the French and Indian War. It's the French and Indian War that initially starts to go relatively well for the French. But as time goes on, goes worse and worse and worse for the French as the English uh, begin to squeeze uh, the French colonies and conquer uh, one French city after another in the New World. So of the uh, 57, going back to this graphic, 
we have again six images or six different varieties, excuse me. And again, fortunately, we have uh, the magazine from Paris from 1757 to help us decide which is the original and which is, is not. Switching it around a little bit. Now the obverse is on the left. And the reverse that we just were looking at is number 11 uh, on the right. So uh, again, you look at the six known varieties for this period and try to match them up. Unfortunately, we come up with another problem as we did the previous year and that there are two very closely uh, matched images that it could be. But here, I can narrow it down a little bit more because the original drawing from which this jeton was created is known. Uh, and it uh, says uh, the, uh, the same underneath the bust that R. Philip uh, uh, Rotier made it uh, is on the original drawing and not uh, the uh, the signature that you see on the one on the left. So even though these two odd verses are very similar, um, I think there's a high degree of certainty that this is the original 1757 Franco-American Chaton. This one is known in both silver and copper. And it's it really has a wonderful design, although as I said, a little more militaristic than the others. It has a wonderful design on it. Uh, but this, uh, in my opinion, based upon uh, my research and the contemporary documentation uh, found in the magazine, is the original uh, 57 Franco-American jeton. Good, and now to the final year, 1758. So here's the 1758 image. The jeton on the screen right now is a more contemporary restrike. Uh, and I'm going to tell you one of some of the easy ways to tell the contemporary restrikes from the original or what I call quasi original restrikes. First, uh, this is gold. Uh, the, when they made the Franco American jetons, when they made all the jetons, uh, in France, uh, at least one gold copy was made, was struck, and that was to be issued and given to the king uh, for his cabinet. Uh, but they were not generally disseminated, distributed uh, in gold, but just copper and silver. So one should always be suspicious uh, of a gold one that uh, pretends to be an original. The other way that you can tell that this is a Contemporary restrike, not not in original. This is one that's made uh, in the uh, within the last fifty years. Is if you look at the, uh, the the edge and you can see how it's on a much larger flan uh, than the originals, and you can tell that because it expands beyond the uh, the the ridging that goes around the dental the denticles sort of that go around it, and they're they're much larger. And so it just has a different um, feel and look uh, than do the original ones. So what's the message that's being portrayed by this one with these uh, eagles flying across the sea? And that is the same valor beyond the sea. That's what the uh, legend says here. A and so what it's trying to say is that the same valor that is found amongst the French people on the continent can also be found in the New World. Again, a militaristic sort of message because now these French colonies are in the midst uh, of a war uh, and they're not doing very well. In fact, Quebec falls uh, and 1758 is the last of the Franco-American jetons because it's the last, really, 
of the of the French colonies, so to speak, although there still remain some French colonies in the New World. They lose New France. They lose Canada entirely uh, to the British. They lose several of their uh, island colonies to the British. Uh, the war, uh, uh, the Seven Years' War, uh, the French uh, and Indian War goes horribly wrong uh, for Louis the Fifteenth, uh, and so with the end of with the end of that goes the end of the Franco-American Jetons. There is no 1759 Franco-American Jeton, even though uh, New France, Canada, under French control, limps into that year. Uh, I guess they felt there was no need to encourage people to settle a colony that was about to be lost. So the heading of this talk is a new taxonomy. So here's what here's sort of the history and, and what the problem is when you look at these Franco-American jetons. As you've seen, they have they have really wonderful messages that are directly tied uh, to the New World. American collectors, by and large, uh, avoid them uh, because of all the problems that I've that I've discussed. People don't know which ones are the originals. Uh, also, one of the big problems is a lot of the literature. Let's see if I can find some. Uh, uh, dealing with them is in French, and most Americans don't speak French. Uh, the other thing is that even when you find literature that discusses these Franco-American jetons, uh, they don't they don't discuss every variety, uh, and they're they're not illustrated. So when you you go through it, so you could come to, you know, you get this book, but then when you look inside, there are no illustrations. So reading in French about these Franco-American jetons and trying to match them up with the written description uh, is relatively impossible. The, the best resource for these uh, is this Wilson sale from 1925. Uh, the problem is it's very expensive, uh, but it uh, has some, if you, if you buy one and you get the plated version, you can look at the plates and you can match up most of them, but it's very, again, it's very expensive uh, and not all of them are represented. Obviously, since 1925, new varieties have come up. Uh, the other thing is with, with bets, bets uh, only has one description of one of them. And obviously, as we've discussed, there are many, many varieties. So they're not all the varieties are not captured. So what I had to do uh, is create a new taxonomy for them. And this is what I've done. First, uh, here I have listed images of all of the obverses. There are 40 different obverses that were used with these Franco-American Jetons. And numbered them one through 40. The numbers are not, sorry, on my PowerPoint slide, but here, what I've done is I put the numbers and the images on all of them. So this takes up just the obverses, uh, takes up four pages. So I put 12 obverses on each page numbering all of them, and then go through each year's reverses. So for 1751, there are three known reverses, and I number them A, B, and C. So therefore, this becomes, which is the original one, is obverse 1751, 1A. Obverse 1 matched with reverse a uh, to create 1751 1a and so forth so if you have a if you find a new one uh, that's not known in the 1751 but it is obverse 6 it's probably going to be a 6a if it's got the alligator it'll be a 6b uh, and so forth and so on so you can match up very easily the the year and the obverse image with the reverse there's there's usually uh, uh, the 1751 is the only one in which there are three 
known reverses. Mostly there's either only one reverse or there'll be two reverses. So really what you're looking for is the obverse and matching the obverse a number with the reverse letter to come up with uh, that. And so here, the, the taxonomy, the best one before this was that Raymond from that 1925 auction catalog that I was showing you. And so here, what I've done is I've done, you know, sort of my new obverses, just this is just the obverses with the uh, Raymond reverses. So you can see how many uh, new obverses uh, I was able to um, discover because they were unlisted uh, in Raymond. But this allows, again, if there is a new one found and it's a 1753, you can say it's a, it would be, if there's a new one that's unknown, it would be number 41. So it would be a 41, 1753, 41, and then probably A. So it'd be a 41A. And that creates a much easier taxonomy. Now that we know which are the originals, which are the restrikes for the most part, um, and we can, uh, you know, better collect these and better understand them. Uh, in my uh, in my book, the next one that discusses these Franco-American jetons, I have pricing uh, for all of them. The best collection of Franco-American jetons now uh, is the Bank of Canada. And the Bank of Canada has a nice website. You can go there and you can, you know, you can look at their their um, Franco-American jetons. Uh, I've, I got their permission to use all the images that they have there that I didn't have already from uh, sales at Stacks, Ford sale and so forth. So I've incorporated all the, the Bank of Canada Franco-American jetons into, into my study, into my taxonomy. All right. So now with the, you know, about 14 minutes left to go, I was able to get through 71 slides. And if Leanna is uh, still there, um, I can take uh, any questions anybody may have. Yep. All right. So I'm going to have you go ahead and stop your screen share. There should be a red button at the top by that green bar that says stop share. Got it. There we go. All right. Then audience members, we already have a few questions in here. Um, so go ahead and send in any others that you have, and we will work our way down the list. Uh, so to start off with, do edge markings help with year of issue for Franco-American jetons? Yes, well, most of the original ones, uh, well, they have a, a reeded edge around them. Even, even the copper ones have a reeded edge around them. And so the ones that I have organized here, these when I have that chart with the varieties, uh, are the ones with either uh, nothing on the edge or a reeded edge. The ones that come later, there's a cornucopia on some, there is a beehive on others. Those are later markings that the uh, Paris Mint used to designate restrikes. And so those are easy to tell apart. So those are not included really in my taxonomy because if you have a franco america jeton that has a bee, not only do they have this cornucopia or beehive on the edge, but they'll also have the metal and French, and so it'll say silver or copper or brass, what have you, on the edge. You know that those are all, I think, post-1830 um, metals, restrikes, and so those are not included in what I'm talking about. I'm only talking about the ones that are the most confusing that have no uh, edge markings other than reading uh, or a plane. I hope that's answered the person's question. All righty. Uh, this is my first jeton lecture. Are jetons a subcategory of metals, or do they really constitute a separate category of numismatics? They are, uh, for the most part, a separate category of numismatics because they are, they are not really, they're sort of in between. They're not metals, they're not coins, they're not tokens, they're jetons. Jetons, uh, I didn't discuss what a jeton was. Uh, but I'll, I'll let you I'll briefly discuss the history of jetons. Before our modern day mathematics, um, imagine, if you will, an abacus. Uh, the way that people did transactions, commercial transactions, is they would have basically, for lack of a better way to describe it, a, an abacus set up on a piece of cloth on a table. And for the beads, in place of the beads, they would have jetons. 
they would have these these round pieces or coins. And so over the years, they became more and more elaborate with their designs and so forth. But the, but the jetons were initially intended to be slid back and forth in order to do simple mathematics uh, on uh, this tablecloth. Uh, and they, they developed over the years. Once modern mathematics came into the fore in Europe, uh, then the jetons purpose uh, as a way to keep track of calculations began to fade, but people loved their jetons. And the government, particularly in Holland and in France, they loved the propaganda aspect of the jetons. And so even though there was no longer a mathematical reason to make jetons every year, every January, the government would make these jetons and they would put them out um, to the populace and people would collect them and they would, uh, they would, they would use them for whatever purpose it is they used them because it was no no longer mathematics. Um, also, they they began to become a way to pay people in effect. So if you had a, a, a private corporation, part of your salary might be in January, you would give, you know, like maybe we give people a turkey. Instead, they would give them maybe 20 jetons, silver jetons, and the head of the company, he might get 150 um, silver jetons. And so in a way, they become a way to, of payment. And so what I've been discussing are the official government issued jetons, but there are many private issued jetons that come into play after the mathematic aspect of them uh, goes away. So that's what a jeton is, for lack of a better definition. And we could probably have an hour discussion on just what is a jeton. Um, but that's what jetons are. So they're a subset of numismatics. Uh, and they are used in some areas as a substitute for money because they're like tokens. So they become a money substitute, although they very, very rarely have a monetary value stamped on them. If we looked at all these images I showed, none of them had monetary values on them. So that's what a jeton is. And there, there's a wonderful world of jeton, particularly the Dutch really like when they're in their 80-year war with the Spanish, they use uh, the jetons to great effect to talk about how evil the Spanish are. Um, so that's, anyway, in a nutshell, that's what jetons are. I'll go to the next question. All righty. Uh, could you recommend a book on jetons generally? If, if right now, well, one, obviously my book will be out within a year. You should probably wait because <laughs> the, the Wilson catalog that I showed you, uh, I've made uh, David Fanning a very rich man collecting all these books um, over the years. So, but if I were to pick one thing right now that you sort of would want to have on these Franco-American jetons, it would really be that uh, 1925 Wilson catalog with the plates. The catalog without the plates is not use, useful for the purpose. Beyond that, there is another book that always vexes me, um, Le Compte. Lecomte's uh, collection of Franco-American jetons was recently sold. It's probably second best and the one that's most used in, in Europe for these. You could also, you know, they're mentioned in Betts, they're mentioned in McLaughlin uh, and other books. Um, but all these books, you know, here's uh, Breton's uh, book on these. It's, this is, it has the benefit of being in English and in French. But uh, to answer the person's question, uh, you can buy the Wilson one. Uh, but altogether, that's probably going to cost you around $300. Uh, if you could wait a year or two, you can get my book for half the price. Mm -hmm. So there you go. There's an advertisement for me, too. There you go. Uh, did the gold survive the French Revolution? Presumably, they would all be from original dyes. Did the gold? What is it? What's the question again? Did the gold survive the French Revolution? Hmm. I'm trying to understand the question. The gold, the, that the gold, that that gold jeton that I showed was a, is a modern. Um, did the did Louis the Fifteenth's gold jetons survive the revolution? Uh, if they did, I've not seen them. I think some of those coins probably, because uh, I think he had a very very large numismatic uh, cabinet. Um, but I have not seen any original gold Franco American jetons. As you know, there are very few. Uh, gold bets medals. There are some, 
um, but there are very few. Uh, gold uh, is not typically uh, what, what you find with jetons. There are silver and copper and brass, um, but I have not seen any original uh, Franco-American jetons in gold. I have seen those recent restrikes though. Uh, but that's not to say that somewhere in France, there is not an original gold one. All right. Can plain edges be original? Yes. It, 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 and, and I say that in, in this respect. So I have a couple here. So here is a, so you can also get a, an idea of the size. Can't, it's not going to help. So this is a uh, an original 1751 Franco-American jeton, and at, I believe that it probably had some a uh, reeded edging on it at one point, uh, but it does not have any reeded uh, edging on it uh, now, and it's it's in a pretty high state of preservation. And so this 1751 Franco-American jeton, remember that's the one with the Indian looking backwards uh, at the lilies. Um, as, the, as I hold it in my hand and I look at it, it's copper, it's not silver. And so probably they didn't think to have any reeded edging on this, this one. Uh, it looks to have been buffed a little bit, um, uh, but it's, uh, it, it is not uh, reeded. It's a plain edge, uh, in my opinion. There are others that are very, very faint, have very faint um, reading on them. Uh, but the silver ones, the original silver ones, do have a very strong reeded edge. Uh, they, it, it, during this period of time, when I look at Franco, when I look at jetons in general uh, in the middle of the 18th century, uh, the silver ones uh, have reeded edges for the most part. But there are some that are uh, that have that are blank, and that's the original 1751 that I just was holding up. So the answer to the question is yes. All right, we have another question about edge markings. Um, and this is the last one we have for right now. So audience members, go ahead and send any last minute questions you have. This is near your last call. Okay, for varieties on thin planchions without edge markings, do we have any idea when the varieties struck with dyes differing from the originals were produced? Does it matter in terms of value? One, right now it doesn't matter in terms of value because no one knows which ones were the originals and which ones were restrikes. And so now that I have told uh, the hundreds of people who are watching this, uh, which is the original, uh, there could be a differentiation. Um, uh, so I can't say moving forward, but I can tell you as of this moment, uh, there is not much of a difference between in price between them. It really comes down to rarity. The biggest difference that you see uh, is between copper and silver. So right now, a silver restrike uh, is worth more than a copper original because probably people don't know that the copper one's the original. Um, but those, those restrikes were often made even before the series was concluded. Uh, I believe that probably just as soon as the year was concluded, they began making restrikes of 1751. So probably in 1752, uh, for, and for the next 200 years, they made restrikes of 1751. So some I call sort of quasi-original because they're still being made within the time period of the series being made. But there, I have one other theory about this because there are a number of the obverses are by different um, engravers. And so what I believe is that if you were an engraver at the Paris Mint, that you had the privilege to go into the Paris Mint with your obverse of Louis the 15th that you made that had your graver's sign uh, uh, signature on it and pull off the shelf any reverse you wanted. This is, so when I talk about all this mess between the different obverses and reverses, it's not unique to the Franco-American Jeton series. It, it crosses all these series of Jetons and Paris. So you could go in, I believe you could go in and you could pull a reverse off the shelf and match it with your obverse and maybe even sell it privately um, uh, to, the, to the public through, you know, however, whatever distribution system you had. So I think that that's part of what created this great confusion. Uh, is that you not only eventually get official government restrikes, but there are these unofficial 
three strikes that are being made uh, by engravers at the Paris Met. That's just my theory at present. All righty, we do uh, have that calls two. That calls two questions. I'm sorry. I said I think there may be more questions now, but yeah, we got a couple whatever. more in here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, did you find an accounting at the Paris Mint or elsewhere of the number of jetons struck? As of now, I have not. I, you know, I've corresponded with uh, Gerard Jambou and, and other people uh, and in Paris. Uh, I'll, I'll freely admit I do not speak French uh, nor Latin. Um, and so it's, it is difficult for me. I didn't set off to, you know, one day create this taxonomy and become the expert in Franco-America jetons, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, but I can have a sense of which ones uh, are rare and which ones are more common. In my book, I go through uh, all the pricing for, for all these jetons. And for some of them, you know, there are, there are many, many um, examples of them being sold. And for others, uh, they are, there are no examples, just the one that I happened to find in the Bank of Canada collection, but with no sale record associated with it. So I have a good sense and I try as best I can through that mechanism, that is through the extent available to determine uh, the rarity. Uh, there, are, there are some that are, while not common, certainly easy to find. You can, again, you can find some on eBay right now. And there are others that may not come to market during my lifetime or ever again, because they're locked in the Bank of Canada's collection uh, and unique. Um, and I've got a good sense of, of what those are. And I try to put that information out in my book. Obviously, I had just an hour to discuss them here today. All right, with the pre preemptory search, I'm not finding any 1756 beehive jetons. Are those particularly scarce? Are they available yes. in both copper and silver? Yeah, they're, they're uh, here. Uh, I have one here, which is the beehive uh, one. Uh, and the silver beehive ones like this, uh, usually they'll go, they'll go for around $700 to $1,200. And the silver ones are, are difficult to, to find. They, they are, there are some in copper, um, but sometimes the copper ones are much rarer than the silver ones. But because collectors gravitate towards silver versus copper, you know, price is a factor of two things, rarity and demand. Uh, and so sometimes even though the copper ones are much rarer than the silver ones, um, the silver ones command a greater price in the marketplace. Uh, but uh, e even, and even in instances in which the copper one might be the original. So, um, and I also think that a lot of the pricing is just, dealers put the price out there and try to get what they can get uh, because I don't think the dealers really know what they have either. And so they may think it's rare, but you know, when I look at it, because now I've done all this research, I know there might be seven or eight of those that have been sold within the last 15 years. Um, so you, you, that's one of the reasons why I feel this whole series has been held back is because it really is a caveat mTOR sort of wild west of collecting on these jetons right now where no one knows what it is they're buying. They think they might be buying something that's rare, but in reality, it's not rare. Or they think they're buying something that's common and it's quite rare. Um, so, you know, I've been quite frankly, I do, I am able to use some of my knowledge to my own advantage and I've been able to pick off some uh, very rare ones in the last couple of years uh, to help uh, pay for my habit of buying books from David Fanning. Uh, so anyway, next question. All right. Um, speaking of books, <laughs> uh, for those of us who speak French, would you please repeat the title and author of the French reference book you mentioned earlier? Yeah. It's uh, the it's Le Compte, L E C O M P T. Give me two seconds, and I will. It's a uh, it's a blue book. I thought I had my briefcase. Um, it, it vexes me. Um, it's a uh, let's see, get the spelling of the right. L. Sorry, I murdered it. 
<laughs> L-E-C-O-M-P-T-E. I never profess to speak French. Uh, Le Compte, uh, and generally that's, he has it uh, divided into years and series. And so he has uh, most of them in there. And his, um, his Franco-American jetons were sold recently in Europe within the last two years. And that's also a good source to help match the Lecomte numbers with some of the, uh, the varieties, even when they don't have il illustrations. All righty. Uh, what will be your book's title and who is publishing it? My book's title uh, is the um, Bet's Companion, uh, and it is being published by the American Numismatic Society. You can pre-order it right now on the ANS website. Uh, if you're an ANS member, I think you get a pretty good discount uh, for it. And right now, uh, ANS is telling me that I should expect them to be available around the first week of December. Again, that'll cover um, bets one through 170. It won't get into these Franco-American jetons because they are you know, a much later bets number, which will be in volume two of my, uh, of my series on bets metals. Uh, again, I stumbled into these Franco-American jetons because they're, they're bets numbered. Um, and, and when I come to a series, I wanna cover it as best I can and cover all the varieties that I can. And that's how I got into, into this. I realized they were just a nightmare and was trying to uh, fix them. Mm -hmm. uh, how many volumes do you anticipate of your compa Bet's Companion book? Three, three volumes. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll cover it, uh, cover it all. I'm, I'm right now, I'm going to have uh, volume two is going to go through the um, uh, proclamation medals of Carlos III, Charles III of Spain. Um, so it'll cover from the end of bets 170 through the proclamation medals. Proclamation medals, by the way, I know this is it's a different co country, but uh, this is on Franco-American jetons, but proclamation medals is also like Franco-American jetons, a wild west sort of buyer beware area. And uh, I have covered all of those um, proclamation medals so far too. The proclamation medals are really fascinating. But right now I'm, I'm almost finished with the, with the proclamation medals of Charles III, and that will be the end of volume two. All righty, then we don't have any other questions in here right now. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. And then if more pop in, we'll hit them before we close it out. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time to present. I think you may have presented at every symposium so far. Uh, so we're always happy to have you back. We always get some new interesting take on a series. So it's great to have you. Thank you, Leanna. Bye, everyone. And for everyone watching, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, we have two groups of sessions left in the symposium. Uh, starting at four, we have Bob Bear and David Fanning presenting. Um, so take a look at both of those. And then this evening, starting at 5.30, we have the Coin Show podcast, uh, which will have a special guest on it that has not been announced. So um, I can almost guarantee you'll recognize who it is. So be sure to tune in for that. Um, and finally, you may have already heard about this, depending which sessions you've tuned into and which facilitators you've seen. Um, but the next symposium, we will actually be partnering with Central States. Um, to do a live hybrid event at their show in April. Um, so everything will still be live streamed online like we're all used to. Um, and then there will also be an in-person component at the show. So we'll be releasing more details on how that's going to work soon, um, but we're very excited to see how that pans out. So that's gonna wrap us up for here. Chris headed out, so it's a good thing there aren't any more questions. <laughs> Thank you everyone for watching and I will be back at 5.30 but tune into one of the other sessions in the meantime and hear from our other presenters. Thank you.